Hello and welcome to Light at the Crossroads. For this introductory show, we'll be talking to Darren Shill and Mike Medalia, the company's co-founders, about how they got started, and then we'll have an in-depth talk with Mike about the mini meditation series, focusing on mini meditations on love that Mike himself illustrated. But first off, here's Mike and Darren on how this whole thing got started. Hello, Darren and Mike. How are you doing? Good. Yeah, very good, Steve. Excellent, excellent. So we're going to talk first off about how Liminal 11 all came together. Do you want to explain the, the secret origin of this company, if you will? <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it started, it actually starts several years before Liminal 11 was even a concept. Darren and I met when we, I started reading uh, at uh, Gosh in London. It was a graphic novel reading group, but I founded it with my friend Mark Haylock. Yeah, so we just decided to do this thing, start it up. Um, it was going to be a graphic novel reading group that also focused on a small press self-published book every month. Yeah, so we got it organized, had the first night, and there at the first night for the first time, I met Darren, who happened to be a long-term friend of Mark's. Yeah, I've known Mark um, since I was five. And we've both of us you know, sort of shared a passion uh, for comics sort of all that all that time. So, so yeah, it was it was natural for me to support him, um, but also I, I, I genuinely wanted to be there. It was a very interesting night, a very interesting crowd. So, yeah. Yeah, because that's the thing. We have a connection from day one that we both have a love of comics, which has, like, been a big part of the company and the identity of the company. But then, but then, so we we knew each other from the reading group. That that went for a few years, and Darren would, you know, come to the, the meetings quite regularly. And then eventually I stopped running that, pass it over to uh, Steve, the, who's on the other, on the line right now. The host. So that's a story for another time, hopefully. And, uh, well, I mean, just actually, I can just tell it quickly. Now, Steve took it, changed it from Comic Gossip, which was the name, and changed, turned it into Reads, which is still going now. So it's still running currently. And this is, that was 100 years ago. So it's the longest <laughs> running Reads of all time. <laughs> But then, but then, so then, but then after that, me and Darren, we would bump into each other. So I, I moved away from the reading group, Darren moved away from, but we'd bump into each other every year and keep in touch. And that was at one of our favorite comic conventions, yeah, uh, Thought Bubble, Bubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in Leeds every year in the UK. I would wait for Darren to pop up to my table every year. And he was, he was great because he would always buy whatever I was selling, the newest product. So he's one of those like, you know, waiting. It was always a short quality. Oh, Promise you. Nice. <laughs> Promise you. That's so nice. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I guess the next step in terms of uh, liminal was um, I, uh, I always, as Mike has said, been following his work for a long time. We would like to catch up. I also kind of followed his, his website. And um, I saw a comment on his website saying um, you should really do a tarot. And uh I thought about that. Um, I, I, I've been a sort of a, a reader for many, many years. Um, it's a passion of mine. It's a, you know, sort of parallel world to the, to the comics. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that in a bit. But um, I just thought, well, Mike has got uh, so much compassion and soul and heart in his work. And his style was so beautiful, too, that I just thought it was a perfect match to create a tarot deck. Um, so I, I contacted Mike. I think I sent him an email. And said, you know, would you like, here's, here's an idea, here's a, here's a crazy thought, um, you know, do you want to come over and have a chat? Um, so he came to mind and we um, we sat down and, and I think, you know, basically we, we kind of like, I, before he came, I was like, this is, I've got to find a way of making this work. So I had like all these various sort of options lined up. So one was just sort of like, okay, we just make the deck and we kind of sell it to a, a publisher, you know, or, you know, just kind of get it out there and see if, you know, whoever out there, one of the big, one of the big boys, was, was interested in picking it up. Uh, number two, I guess, was was kind of we set up, do a little Kickstarter, whatever, we kind of do it all ourselves, we kind of fundraise and, um, you know, crowd, crowdfunding, if you will, um, and a platform to launch it on. And then the final one was like we, we start up our own publishing company. And, and when I said that, Mike's eyes... Lit up, am I right, Mike? Yeah, well, if I had known now, <laughs> <laughs> there were clouds. <laughs> no, yeah, the exact opposite. Yeah, yeah. I, it's funny because that, yeah, exactly. And I, I could have had the story from a different way, uh, same story. But when I got the email from Darren, he kind of mentioned these few options, and they're like helping fund the deck, or helping find a publisher, or helping start something. And I thought, I thought, you know, I knew like like Darren was, um, you know, financially had was able to help a little bit, like in this regards, I imagine. So I thought, okay, this is like a legitimate business thing. But also, who does this? Who wants to just reach out to make a piece of art and help fund it? Because that was where he was kind of coming from in the very beginning. And I found that very moving, but also like, I couldn't, I was sort of like, 
well, this can't be real because either, like this sort of thing isn't, you know, it's usually publishers wanting a product from you and that sort of thing. So, but, I, but I also said, okay, I'm going back to Canada for a few months. I was going back for about a month. Let's meet after that. And that was my idea is that he would talk himself out of this. And he realized, <laughs> you know, capitalism isn't, doesn't uh, want you to just spend money supporting artists, making for the pure sake of art for art's sake. Uh, but then when I met him, he had had all the thoughts he was just explaining about yeah. the different ways of doing it. And I thought he would talk himself out of it. Instead, he talked him. He talked it up to this idea of a whole publisher. And so it was actually it was actually like he, he dreamed this giant dream in the meantime. And I felt that was really cool. Yeah, it's, that's funny you're putting it. I just sort of remember that it, it kind of had happened a little bit in the middle. It was kind of like when you sort of fuck you for both of us, we sort of sat on it. It was interesting that we had that time to kind of reflect. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we did actually sort of sit down and kind of think, you know, are we going to do this? You know, we, we wasn't whilst it might have felt like completely out of the blue at the same time. We had reflected on this, and we had we had both given this personal thought. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that that space that's true because I think in the meantime I had dreamed up a little bit too, like well maybe he mm. wants maybe there's more to all this, but then but that's why we moved so fast. Yeah, we bought the domain that day. Yeah, we got all the yeah. social media that yeah. day. Yeah, we're like we just moved so fast. We started registering the business the next week. Yeah, and and that was the crazy part. <laughs> so yeah, it did it did suddenly it, it kind of. It, it, it got a life of its own, and it was it was off to the races. And there was a few cool bits. I, I will say now in officiality that Darren's instincts are are very much to be listened to. Um, I wouldn't say blindly trusted because that's just, <laughs> no, no, I'd agree. But more than anyone I know, his instincts after just after just experience are very strong. And that was a lot of that was in the meeting. So you had the idea of tarot, you had the idea right away. You said I want to do a tarot product and a yoga product, which were our first two big products. Mm. And and also you had the name. Yeah. So I mean, we'll go back and forth a little bit. So the, the name of Gum was kind of strange. It was kind of one of these four in the moment, four in the morning kind of dreamlike moments. I'd, I'd woken up, I grabbed a piece of paper, uh, I had a red pen, so I was writing in red ink, and I don't know why that's significant, well, but yeah. it still stays with me. And so I was writing in red ink, and and so I came out with the liminal so it was only sort of really that at that point and then i was sort of running out a mission statement about you know what we want to do what our aims were you know, we'll come back to that a bit later probably but um uh and then it was like liminal what were liminal limited there's this ration there it doesn't really work you know liminal publishers it just didn't nothing sounded right so i was i was, I was grasping for a number because you know numerology and kind of it, it kind of fitted with the ethos of the company we it was a it was a space in which we get out a bit of depth to, to what we're about so, so I, I, anyway, I'll, I'll give my so my eleven came and I, I think I had my own reasonings for that. Yeah, because you had a few other numbers too. You oh yeah yeah. You said seven. Yeah, uh, seven. I think. Um, Maybe I mean, eight seven. was an obvious one. Yeah, course. yeah. Like financial. Yeah. Is traditionally associated with financial success, so it seemed like well, that seemed a little too on the nose for a business. Exactly. Yeah, there's, there's an esoteric business. Sort of a Chinese numerology there. I think you're right, right, on, right. On, on the eight. Um, yeah, and, then, and seven, you know, seventy is an awful lot, of course. It's uh, quite a magical number. But either, yeah, they, they felt a bit too, yeah, either a bit too uh, financially hard or a bit too on the nose. And But there was a, the reason I remember you explaining the combination why 11, five and six. Yes. So, well, five... Um, uh, in in some in some aspects, I think it's capitalistic. Perhaps it's five um, has uh, connections with sort of mankind of humanity, and six can sometimes be um, associated with um, with if you picture uh, sort of hexagrams or two triangles, one above, one one pointing up, one pointing down. It's kind of a connection between sort of the higher self and sort of the lower self, if you will. So there's a there's a sense there that it's it's striving towards the higher self. But so the five plus the six sometimes in a sort of a capitalistic sense can can sort of be pointing towards um the development of yourself and, and sort of uh, being guided towards a, a better self if you will and that, that really suited the aims i thought of liminal that we were trying to produce things that would help people and support people and, and kind of um bring up the best you know bring up personal development yeah, I always love five, six, universe, like the universe and then the human world. Yeah. And that also became our, um, which was another Darren suggestion, lay at the crossroads for our tagline. They tie in with this. The whole thing is meant to be this sort of in between for, yeah, when people are searching for that, the spiritual answers and are looking into esoteric topics or looking to, you know, we're mind, body, spirit. So looking to just even expand their body in a spiritual way um, through yoga or, or physical practices. But yeah, light at the crossroads became a beautiful sort of symbol of that five and six of the eleven, 
there's like a lot of symbolism all tied in, which yeah, which was is it was it was conscious and unconscious at the same time. Yes, it was it's pretty much half baked into. It's a funny thing. It just people we do get asked about the name. People are in, and people that are in the esoteric world as well. You know, even you know even there, it's kind of like this. That's an unusual name, there. Eh? What's what's the story? Something. But yeah, there was there was definitely thought there. Anyway, I, I, I said to my Mark, I sort of gave I suggested the name. Um, yeah. And I said, yeah, so liminal. And I said, um, you know, plus a plus a number. And that was a moment. That yeah. was a real moment because I I am um, as Darren was talking, I was thinking in my head. I remember specifically saying, don't say 11, or I bet he's going to say 11, kind of both things at the same time. Because for me, 11 was always a big number. I just, when I was um, young, I don't really actually tell. I'm not sure how much detail I'll give into this, but uh, it became a really special number to me when I was about 22, uh, which is a multiple of 11. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was, and it's associated with my spiritual beliefs, personal. It's like a personal made-up symbol to represent my own uh, mesh of Zen Buddhism and Taoism, and then my personal spiritual beliefs at 22, which, are, <laughs> uh, which you know, now yeah. now that I know life is much more complex, they, they seem very <laughs> shallow. But I actually like to hold on to that innocence of that time. So that was a big number for me. I just really liked it. I have the tattoo in Mayan uh, numerology on my hand of number 11, and throughout the years, it just became a big part of me. The classic thing everyone has of seeing 11, 11, the time, you know. Whatever. And then I started combining numbers and it became a whole sort of way for me to communicate with the universe as well. Uh, I got married on November 11, 2011. So 11, 11, 11. So as Darren was talking, I was thinking, don't say 11 because I was like, then I'm screwed. I have to do this. <laughs> Can't get out of it. But then I was also saying, say 11 because yeah. it's the best. Like, it's just it's just a sign from the universe. And so he said 11. I think I said fuck off. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, you did. You did. You did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In a nice way. You did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that was at that point just like let's do it kind of thing. It was really nice. It was really quite nice. So yeah, I guess so so I guess in a nutshell, that was the 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 the, the origins of where it where it really began. Uh, we had we had a few titles at, at that time as well. So the Lunar Soul Tarot was the tarot deck of it. We're talking about here. Um, yeah. Do yoga anywhere? Sort of came out. Yeah. Two products. We worked on that. Yeah. Yes. That's right. And then the mini meditation series, which you you sort of had in development before mine. Yeah. So that was interesting. That was a project I was developing. Um, the mini meditations, which are like books of illustrated quotes, and I was developing it as a personal project to follow on with um, my. Uh, I had the series One Year Wiser, which was like a four part series, and in, um, two of them were bestsellers. And then two of them were not bestsellers. <laughs> um, uh, and um, and uh, so I was hoping this would be another sort of good line to start. Uh, and I was developing that to start pitching around to publishers with my agent elsewhere. Uh, but then so once uh, Liminal started, I decided that it would be a perfect thing for us to launch. Um, but because the reason we launched that as well is because we thought that uh, there were safer products and they would be a bit more widespread appealing because we didn't expect, I don't think, the success we had with the tarot. The Lunar Soul yeah. really blew up. It was it was a small print run, but I mean, but it was enough to distract us and go, oh, this is a thing. And then once we started revealing images of the modern witch, I think, yeah. But that's a longer story, I think. Yeah. Well, just then to move on to, you know, now the company in your story has been established and founded by the pair of you. What, what would you say is the the aim of the company, the sort of intent of the company? I hopefully, we 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 still stick to what we started with very much which as, as as sort of touched on earlier within the name of our company within uh, our sort of tagline lights the crossroads i think it, it is hopefully there for inspiration and guidance a lot of our work um you think of the tarot it's uh, very much these days it's less perhaps of a fortune telling uh device it's, it's more about revealing sort of you know personal problems or personal issues you might have and, and um, very much more about now than, than, than the future so it's really more about what's going on around you and, and kind of maybe seeing things in a different way and providing inspiration for that so i think that that sort of touch is very strong on what we do things like the with the yoga again it's it's uh, it's uh, you know, I've experienced that, and in my case as well, I'm not sure many people have, that, you know, yoga can be, it's good for the body and the mind, you know, and that's, that's a perfect thing for someone like you know, having to be involved with. Um, I think mindfulness as well, Mike, was... Um, yeah, mindfulness was an early topic, but we haven't done much on it uh, up to date, except now we have our first graphic novel coming up about it. But that was my sort of, I'm a Zen Buddhist, and then I wanted to... Um, 
bring through things with mindfulness. But that's uh, yeah, and there's there's a few things. I mean, that's the aim. that's definitely the big aim of the company. And I look to those things sometimes to make sure I'm on track in my own personal career, and then now with the business to make sure those things are top priority because. I just, I don't know, you know, everyone, I guess I imagine I can converse with the universe a little bit. And I've, I've sort of noticed that the universe seems to seems to be more, if the intent behind a project isn't entirely sort of like financially based or some sort of ego project, it seems to try to, I do find that the universe uh, will let projects with a proper intention thrive a bit more. Yeah. Um, and it's just my own theory, obviously, yeah. just oh, based sure. on my own experiences with life. And so with this, I'm always coming back to that top priority that we're making books that are good, books that are um, worthwhile, products that are um, um, spiritually important, that will like uh, alone in a room, someone can connect with them and have a really deep spiritual moment or a moment of comfort or a moment of um, creative inspiration. Uh, that's that's the final thing for any product. And, but then yeah. but juggling that, then the other aims of the company, we're sat here in our offices right now, is just to stay afloat for the next couple of years. We're a new company. That's another big aim. So so that's what we're trying to do, too, and make products that are like really exciting. People want to like buy and, and recommend. And so that's a that's like a, a, a when you pick a business, you pick um, the topic you're going to be or whatever you're going to be selling in that business which is the thing you should be passionate about, but isn't always the case, um, which we are definitely passionate about. But then we also have the business side, which is kind of fun as well, because it's been just yeah. just an amazing kind of experience, how quick it's it's blown up. And I think something that links the two between both the sort of spiritual aims and kind of like the, you know, the business side, if you will, is um, what we hope is sort of the, the, the quality and the look and the feel of, the, of, of what we're producing. Yeah. Um, it's so, so important that, you know, if, if somebody is going to take something from a, from an item, from a book, from a, from a tarot deck, whatever it might be, it should be as beautiful and as, and as, and as precious as it possibly can be, because then you're going to, hopefully you have a deeper relationship with that, that item, with that book, with that tarot deck that, you know, it feels like something you want to hold in your life. And then, you know, connecting with the business side, it's something that people really want. It's, you know, it's got to be as good as we can possibly make it so that you know it's uh, so that people understand you know it's, it's, it's coming from Liverpool and hopefully you know it's going to be it's going to be something I'm, I'm really looking forward to we know they're going to do something beautiful yeah because that's part of what we've set up as the structure of the business which will al- almost always hang out over our over our heads I imagine is that our products need to be printed the tarot deck there'll be apps for it eventually that are really cool and everything but there'll always be physical tarot decks. Yeah. I mean, as, as long as I'm alive, I, I can predict, I, I suspect, you know, and books as well. Books are not disappearing, but in fact, if you're going to own a book, you want it to be more beautiful because, well, why should I own this piece um, when I could have it digitally? Why should it fill my house? Oh, because it's a beautiful item. So that's like, it's like we have the spiritual aims of the company to always be providing light at the crossroads. But then from a design point of view, we're like, well, we always want to be making beautiful, amazing things that just like move you to hold them. That's another sort of that is a, it's a spiritual achievement, but it's also a creative artistic one that like yeah. is a constant thing we go back to as well. And I think our audience has picked up on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just from the feedback and stuff. But absolutely. If you look at things like I believe the uh, folk magic and healing, uh, Fezzing Crying, it's, um, you know, it's uh, uh, the, the, every little bit of detail there, you know, uh, we, you know, when this is Fez's skills and talents sort of pouring through it. Um, uh, really comes to the fore, and the modern witch tarot. You know, it's uh, the packaging was as was as you know the artwork was obviously stunning and it's iconic. Yeah, it's, it's something it's something that that, that massively stands apart um, from the crowd. But we we had to we had to do it justice. We had to kind of you know match that with the production values and the design so that we felt that we done right by Lisa and and, and right by the modern witch itself as a, as a standalone thing, so that people could really you know make the most of their their time with them yeah i mean i feel like it would be interesting to discuss the whole modern witch one day because that was just a a really amazing amazing this has been an amazing thing for us but um but there was a point when me and darren we you know we commissioned it quite early on in in both the modern witches project uh, days and also the days of the company but as it developed we knew more and more we're onto something really big here so it's exactly what darren said we had to do justice to it we had to like go all out on production because it would be just the worst to have. It'd be obvious that Lisa just did this amazing job, and then the publishers, you know, juiced the margins right down to the right down to like the <laughs> the, the, the rind, you know, or whatever whatever you're left with after you juice a, a piece of fruit. 
And you've mentioned a few products there, but where where does the company stand now in terms of the sort of the scope of, of production, the different sort of products that have been released? One one thing, I mean, moving on, we were just talking about Modern Witch Tarot there. Um, so Tarot is, is, is going to carry on, you know, the Lunar Soul Tarot and the Modern Witch Tarot, both very grateful for, for how they've been received by people. And, and we'd love to, we, to, to keep creating decks that, uh, are standing in a fresh space. I don't think we we, we don't we'd ever uh, necessarily do the same deck twice, but you know we we, we stand by the values that, that of diversity and uh, inclusivity that, that that come through in in the modern age tarot. Uh, but but artistically, um, you know, one deck will always look very very different to the other, and always have a different message and a different sort of maybe heart to it. It should do. Um, otherwise, you know, why why repeat? So yeah, Tarot's definitely going to be part. We've got two coming out this year. Um, so Tilly Walden, who um, did uh, mini meditations on creativity, was fantastic. She's doing uh, the Cosmic Slumber Tarot for us. And Alba Ballesta Gonzalez is doing um, the White Human Tarot. And both of them, very, very different decks, but, but both equally stunning and, and we're, uh, incredibly proud to be associated with them. Um, and then there's more decks in the future, including Oracle decks. We'll, yeah. Um, yeah, Oracle will have a couple going, and and then some spin-off book publications based on Tarot. I think actually with our with some comics we have coming out, we have two comics, and, you know, one our web our ongoing web series, um, the Tales of the Tarot, and then a, a new comic we have coming out soon, which is an unannounced, um, but uh, but maybe by the time this is out, it will be announced. So actually, it's looking like the company will be like fifty percent Tarot, and then a few other things over time because of just like. Um, yeah, the success we've had with it. Yeah, so I think that's probably a big way in terms of content. But they're also really fun to make tarot. That's yeah. the fun thing. It's like yeah. it's not so bad. They're 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 a lot more to produce than a book. You know, as you can imagine, there's a lot more moving parts in the final piece, in the final in the final product. But they're just so cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's no denying. We've got two back yeah. from the printer so far, and I don't think there's a better feeling. And then yeah. when the when more come, it's just they're just so awesome. And and also for a small company to have more of a, a focus or us to be known as tarot, mainly a tarot publisher is not a bad thing, especially with tarot's popularity rising as well. So oh yeah, maybe this is a bit too insidery to be interesting, but uh, yeah, yeah that's well, where we're at with it. Yeah, but this I just might touch on there. That's quite interesting. All of our uh, as we said at the beginning, you know, comics is a is a passion of uh, very much of Mike's and, and, and me too. And um, and when all of you know, pretty much all the artists we've used are, are comic related artists. Um, you know, it's it's it, we think it's uh, it's an underused um, uh, sort of resource, underused sort of you know uh, talents out there. Uh, Tara really suits um, comic artists. They know how to tell a story using pictures. It's it's that simple. They are the perfect people to be out there creating tarot. So that's 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 wonderful. But but sticking with the comics, as Mike mentioned, we 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 actually is only the this year, uh, twenty twenty, that we're actually producing our first comics and graphic novels. Um, so there's the as, as Mike mentioned, there's a tarot circle. Uh, which is, yeah, um, yeah, the tarot circle is the new one coming. We haven't announced it yet. It's yeah. a but it is an ongoing series. I think we can comfortably say that the team uh, it's uh, Leah Moore writing it. And Ivy Burchess uh, illustrating it, and then also illustrated by Jem Milton. There's a, there's a sort of historical section. It'll be yeah, five part comic that will then get collected into a trade. And then the garden. Yeah, and then the garden's our first comic, our first graphic novel of all time out this autumn, uh, this spring by Fumio Obata, illustrated by Fumio Obata, written by Sean Michael Wilson. It's about gardening and mindfulness. So I'm really excited to start getting back, uh, exploring ideas of mindfulness to the company, uh, and that's just, that's out this year. There is, and then there's another sort of. So as you can see, we're very passion based. Uh, Tara, Dar- Darren has loved the tarot for 30 years, and you know, whenever we have parties, launch parties, or signings, uh, we always set up a table, and and even at our festivals, and Darren does tarot readings for people, and it's just amazing. Uh, and that passion comes through the company. We love comics. We know that they're not going to even touch the sort of scale of return on investment that a, that a tarot deck might, because uh, you know, as a comic artist myself, I know painfully how how small that market is. But we just don't. We just want to publish a, a, at least a handful or one or two a year that we love because it's, it's our passion and those are projects that really mean a lot to us. Um, and 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 then there is a we're we're just taking baby steps into uh, hopefully potentially developing um, our first board and card games um, because that's another passion that we both have. We both love card games. We're just nerds basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Straight uh, very nerdy. Uh, <laughs> way too, yeah. But it's another area that we're really passionate about. But also there's a connection between tarot card publishers and, and, and board and card game publishers historically. Um, so it doesn't, it's not as far of a, of a leap as it might seem initially. So that's all future stuff that hopefully comes to light. All very exciting. Thanks so much for your time, guys. You're very welcome, Steve. No, it's been, been great to chat. Thank you for... Um, yeah, thanks so much, Steve. Let us know, is this, will this be on the TV or where do we get to watch this? It's going to be on uh, Sky Sports News uh, every hour on the hour. I don't, I don't know why. They insisted. Well, I'll see you there then. I know for a fact I'll talk to one of you again soon. And uh, I'm sure we'll find an excuse to sit down and chat more about Liminal 11 in the future. Thanks so much. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Steve. Cheers. Thanks to Mike and Darren for talking to us. And now let's have a chat with Mike all about mini meditations. Hello, Mike. Thanks for joining us again. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. We're going to be talking about mini meditations on love uh, for this Valentine's Day special. Mini meditations was a sort of a concept that predated Liminal 11, really, wasn't it? It was the sort of follow up to my original, my first published book series, One Year Wiser, it was the sort of follow up to that. It was like the I feel like it was like the fiscal follow up in a way, if that's the right word. So it was like that we had found that the gift books from One Year Wiser were doing really well. The first book that came out, the 365 uh, Illustrated Meditations, where there's like an illustrated quote for every day. That was the book that launched the series was doing really well and it still is doing really well in a ba- and it's still backlisting well and selling, which is really nice. So after a couple of different versions of One Year Wiser. There was like a gratitude journal. Uh, there was a coloring book that came out very cl- close around the same time as the as the 365 book. Actually, I think even the coloring book came out slightly earlier in the end because of it was like a rush to, it's like the coloring book rush. It's like our version of um, of a gold rush, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> there's money to be made. Let's just, cause it's, you know, it's a tough industry. So whenever there's like a little, a little uh, pipe of uh, profit, uh, you funnel into it. But One Year Wiser came out at a perfect time that landed right then. So it's sort of like second wave of the coloring books. And so it did really well. It's picked up by all the major shops in North America and yeah, sold loads and loads of copies. That was fun. And so and then I brought out a gratitude journal, which didn't sell very well. And then I finally my first fully authored. It was so it was One Year Wiser, an illustrated guide to mindfulness. And it was a fully illustrated graphic novel on mindfulness. So that was my second. That was the last book in the series. And by then it just just wasn't doing anything really. You know, as soon as I started, stopped using the words of famous writers and started using the words of nobodies like myself. I mean, as like unaccomplished, un- unexperienced writers like myself, the interest phased out. But that obviously is not true. I think it was more just the fact that it's um, a graphic novel. You know, it's a totally different thing. And I'm still proud of the book. Like, I think that's that's something that that book was just nice to make. And, and then it, people seem to connect with it in like libraries and stuff like that. Uh, because it's it's available in libraries a lot around North America, so I get a lot of like tweets and stuff or messages of people having picked it up from the library, which I don't know is exactly what, why I, I want to make art is just to connect with individual people at the end of the day, you know. Um, and yeah, if I can make a living at it too, that's optimal. And the concept of mini meditations that you moved on to was, you know, the idea of different themes and ideas, but also looking at it commercially as well, tapping into that that market of gift books that can sit very comfortably on a till point and act as really good things for staff to hand to customers or for customers to spot and and you know see as an impulse purchase to use a bit of trade jargon yeah exactly that was that was the kind of fun thing i thought i mean i figured you could just do anything and then do it the best in terms of i guess that's a general principle but also i thought not even the best in terms of arrogance, but the best in terms of like making it something beautiful. So it was sort of like, well, I know gift books seem really trivial, but if they're beautiful pieces of art that are like given as gifts, so they're like, oh, here, I thought about you. And when I, when I purchased this, so then there's sentiment around them. And then there, then there becomes the experience of using them, of sitting with them over and over again, of them sitting on your bedside table, um, you know, being close to you, items you pick up and read through and then eventually you read them at times when you really need to you know because they're like oh they're perfectly designed for a little dose of comfort when you're feeling down or or a dose of focusing your energy if you are feeling a certain way you know so for for trivial items they can become really special so the idea with when you're wiser and then on to mini meditations was to just make them really beautiful tactile objects that make you feel nice when you pick them up and then when you start to open them and flip through them they're like full of color and brightness and 
And so they give you an aesthetic feeling as well. I think that's the sort of the double punch, you know, it's like you feel good when you when you think of the concept and hold the book and then you open it up and it's like, boom, now it's beautiful. And then you're like, all oh, right, I'll take it. You know, that's sort of the, the the idea, I think. But but easier said than done to accomplish that with every publication. And of course, it was always conceived as a series and you've had a variety of different artists working on the different ideas. But you did you actually illustrated mini meditations on love for yourself. Yeah, so there's a bit of the story there that's missing where I uh, finished One Year Wiser. I was I was wrapping up the One Year Wiser series, and uh, it was wrapped up. I mean, I finished that last book, and I knew that would be the last one. And then um, and then I was just developing what was going to be next. So the mini meditation series was actually just going to be my own personal series that I was going to draw and publish. And I was in discussion with a few publishers, and we've been pitching around for a while. Uh, not that long, but I mean, sort of, it was in the air, which is the idea. So it hadn't sort of necessarily settled anywhere. It wasn't contracted or anything. Uh, and then I, you know, to flash, and then it kind of syncs up with where I'm starting to talk with Darren, because that's all about the same exact same time when this is in development, right when I was talking to Darren about Liminal 11. Um, and this was supposed to be my next big project. I was going to draw four of them a year. So that would have taken up, you know, more than half my year. Um, and just been, you know, relatively full time project. So then, then I started talking to Darren about starting the company, and we started developing projects. We knew we wanted to do a tarot deck and something else. And then uh, there came a point where, yeah, we said um, we need we need a couple more titles just to make our first launch. So it wouldn't just be, you know, it ended up being we launched with four titles, but really we only had one at the start: Luna Soul, and then uh, Women Plus Passive Plants was in development, but it wasn't really sort of taking shape so we needed a few more and then i was talking we were at lunch with my my um uh, agent uh samar and uh because she was helping us just sort of you know get our heads around the company and everything because she had she has lots of uh, experience uh in 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 publishing samar hamam yeah and that's when we realized let's do the mini meditation series uh, it was in that conversation we were having lunch, like, oh, we need more. Well, what about the mini meditations? Oh, yeah, we could take it. But I couldn't draw because I was already doing the uh, the tarot deck at that point. So then we thought, I think a click was like, oh, we should get other people to illustrate it. And then we could bring in more people and, you know, it helps sort of expand the range of our our of our of our getting our, our sort of our first line out there. We could we could work with other artists and they could help us sort of announce the products, announce the publisher and announce everything and sort of kick it off. And we did really well with that. You know, we got good, good artists, to, really great artists to draw the first few series. So so that is a long way of tying it back to why I did love, which is because I was always going to. So the series was always a kind of pitch to launch with the love is the first book. And then I think many meditations on cats was in discussion with one publisher for the to be the 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 other one to go with it, uh, which still it hasn't been drawn, but um, yeah. So that was why I decided to do it because it was just always there. But it's obviously I don't know. It's love. It's like the it's the the topic of, of of life, isn't it? It's the the single the single great one. It's like I guess maybe it was arrogance to be like, yeah, I'll tackle that one. That's the big one. But um, but yeah, but I don't think I, I did tackle it entirely. You know, like it's a it's an elusive thing, love. In terms of your process, was it a lot of sketch work, developing visual ideas that you were to share, or were you sort of taking it quote by quote, page by page, developing each one of those from the ground up? Yeah, I was just doing it sort of intuitively. So because at this point, I I illustrated like hundreds of hundreds of quotes because, you know, at least 365 for the first one year wiser. And then just like a bunch more for the other books and for other things. It was just sort of like just lots of illustrated quotes. So I think this book, I was just sort of an autopilot and it actually felt like I was running on steam for a lot of it, like the end of what I could do with this. You know, I've illustrated enough quotes, the same sort of visual motifs just keep appearing and appearing and appearing, I find. Um, and I don't think to the reader, it would, that's what I had to keep telling myself because I felt like, God, I'm such a, I just keep making, drawing the same things over and over again. But I think there's a sort of freshness to each each uh, person who picks it up. And they wouldn't know the work as intimately as I would to realize the the sort of reoccurring things. But I do feel like, yeah, I was definitely these were the this was definitely the end. of. So if I which is which is to say that if I had drawn the whole series myself, four books a year, I think I would have quickly tired of that. But the nice thing is the nature of the book means it's almost like even if you're using the same visual motifs across the book, the different quotes sort of recontextualize them and refresh them? 
Yeah, definitely. That was the idea. That's the, that's that was the hope I think down the line. But um, yeah, that would have been the idea. But I'm glad. I mean, I have I've since then stopped really drawing. That was the last thing I've drawn. Love and you know, I, I sort of haven't drawn anything in, in a quite a long time. Like I guess it's about coming up to a year now since doing that, which is sort of interesting for me because I was for the previous four years of just producing endlessly. I think over a thousand pages for print. For me, that's quite a lot. You know, what I mean, for some. For some comic artists, that's like a year's work. You know, there's a few people I think we are thinking of the same. But um, but for me, that was like you know just quite quite a, a big chunk. So and now I've uh, just stopped entirely. So I think the whole thing's kind of run its course for me. Uh, this whole phase of sort of uh, expressing myself visually, at least for now. And let's be fair, over the last year you've been busy. So. Yeah, exactly. It's been transitioning as well to try to figuring out like, yeah, sort of re-identifying myself as like, okay, now I'm just working on this, trying to launch Liminal and keep it going um, and not necessarily, you know, I'm just taking a, some time out from being a creator. But but being a creator is such a key part of my identity. And I think a lot of creators' identities is that you're just used to creating and making new things. So it is kind of like weird. I feel odd, you know, but it's, but it's not like I'm completely out to sea because on my own or like just completely gone from the shores of creativity if that's a way of putting it because I'm working on so many creative projects at Liminal that I see tons of things sort of develop now and and go all the way through and I get to put my creative touch on them as I go but um your role in the company is not just administrative you are making creative choices every day aren't you yeah I guess that's that's the fun thing is that it's really the creative choices that me and Darren are making on a on a regular basis that are actually what's at the sort of top level of the success of the company uh, because those creative choices are what lead to like who we ch- choose to work with and all that sort of stuff and then how we choose to present the products and and uh, and design everything and, and, and even just the crazy ideas of like oh the special edition and all that sort of stuff that's really fun that's really nice to know that it's the chemistry between me and Darren and, and our creative chemistry that really allows these projects to be what they are and that's sort of yeah, because as you say, we're not just administrative, which feels like it. You know, it feels like we're just constantly doing so much admin because that's what it takes to really launch a business. There's like, you know, the 20, 30 different areas you need to be focusing on. And each area has like a bunch of different things. But uh, yeah, so so it's all it's good for now. It's it's nice. It's uh, it's I'm sort of but uh, but there's a there's a larger question, I think, as well, um, because it's for me now is like, well, I can re-identify myself as an artist because. I had previously been making art as my way of living, you know, as my to make my my salary or whatever. So I so it was really kind of commercially driven, but I was still really determined to make it on my own terms, like publish my own books under my own name and make my living that way. Yeah, I guess I'm not a, I'm not a, a commercial illustrator for that reason, because I like to just make things from scratch and just be left alone. But knowing that I can make a, something that's commercially successful, well, should be, but, you know, it's, it's not always is. So now I can make, but now because the company is sort of stabilizing and, and hopefully I can um, sort of make a living through that moving forward. Uh, fingers crossed, of course, hopefully it's a big hope. I can re-identify myself as an artist and I can just sort of decide what I want to make without the sort of need to make money. So it doesn't even have to be illustration or comics or anything. It can just be literally anything now that I want. And, and as a creative person, I do have various pursuits that I think I could sort of go down, you know, whether it's like music or or painting or photography or whatever. So that's a weird one. So I think that's what's stopping me as well, because I think also I know when I start a new, when I start something new creatively, I'll really get into it and really give it my all. You know, like it took me like, I felt like last decade was a decade of, okay, I wanted to get published. I wanted to be an illustrator. I wanted to be an artist, a comic artist and an author. And I want to be published. That was the big one. And, and, and that was like, that was that big pursuit, you know? And now I feel like, okay, that's stabilizing. And uh, what's, and you know, it just happens to be 2020, the beginning of a new decade. So it sort of, sort of, you know, uh, makes that even clearer that, that, that idea. But uh, yeah, so I think what's, what, what am I going to really get into? And I have some suspicions what it'll be, but I'm a bit nervous because then it's like, I'll just get obsessed with it as I, as I have been. We'll wrap things up there, but before we go, I think it would be remiss not to ask you what your favourite quote or possibly your favourite illustration of a quote in many meditations or on love, like the, the page you're proudest of, perhaps. That's funny to, that you put it that way, because I, when I, when you asked, when you sort of uh, said we were going to be doing this at the end of the podcast to you know, give me a heads up, I, I knew the page right away, and then I, but I think it was because it was personally my favourite drawing. So I went back and read the quote, but I actually think the quote's quite good too. Um, but it's it's just it's I mean it's very specific. 
it's very specific to, I guess, love between, you know, romantic love or family love, like specifically to people, you know, for a long period of time. So obviously friends and stuff like that. The quote is by uh, W. Somerset Mom, and it reads, We are not the same persons this year as last, nor are those we love. It is a happy chance if we, changing, continue to love a changed person. Yeah, I like that one. And maybe I'll put it here, too, because people always ask me what my favorite quote in One Year Wiser is. And I can't I don't even I wouldn't be able to find the page to say who the quotes by. But I always love this quote. And I, it would be fun to leave on this because it has nothing to do with love. So it seems unbelievably appropriate. <laughs> but uh, but I always really love it. It says uh, it just take, will take me a second to think of it. The world is wide and I will not waste my time in friction when it can be spent on momentum. Mike, thanks so much once again. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. And we'll certainly talk to you again in the future. Okay. See you next decade. (laughs) Thanks again to Mike for talking to us, and thank you for listening. See you next time. This show is a Holdfast Network production. Go to holdfastnetwork.com for other programs you may enjoy.